Next up is a longer story by Dave Eggers. He's the founder of the magazine McSweeney's, author of many books. His recent sequel to The Circle is a book entitled The Every. And of the story that is going to be read now, um, Egger, Dave Eggers said, I figured the world needs more stories set in Idaho, so I wrote one. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. It's a story broken into four parts. We've got four actors to read them. Uh, I'm one of them at the very end. Um, <laughs> I watch I'm going to sing Taylor the Latte Boy for you. <laughs> um, so four actors are going to be here. Uh, we have Kennedy Kanagawa, who has appeared in shows such as Lolita, My Love, and during the worst of the pandemic, he did an entire one-man show on Zoom for selected shorts. Also, Tony nominee Emily Skeggs, who re recently starred in a film, Dinner in America, and we're grateful to her parents for bringing her here when she was a child. So thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Skeggs. Um, and, uh, and this guy, what can you say? James Naughton, who, uh, you know, Mr. Naughton, he has done so many projects on Broadway, for everything, everything. Paper Chase, I think, was the first, James? The Paper Chase. Yeah, what year was that? 72, the, the movie The Paper Chase uh, with uh, John Houseman and James Naughton. Um, uh, anyway, he also won a Tony doing the revival of Chicago. He has been with Selected Shorts since 1989 and holds the record for the most appearances, 45. <laughs> so here now to read Dave Eggers' Where the Candles Are Kept, a story about Idaho, are Kennedy Kanagawa, Emily Skeggs, James Naughton, and me. Where the candles are kept. Oshin. Oshin was at the airport to pick up two wayward young people, cousins to each other, grandniece and grandnephew to him. One was Kala, who he knew a bit, haunted eyes, twig thin, freckled, languid. She was probably 19 by now and was somehow entangled in drugs. A classmate of hers had overdosed, or almost overdosed, and Kala was involved, or to blame. She'd thrown the party. The other kid was Torin, a few years younger than Kala. He was, what, maybe 15 by now? Oshin remembered him from the last reunion, a shy boy always on the periphery, his eyes watchful behind a tangle of black hair. His mother, Evie, had a stroke three months ago, and the idea was that a month in Idaho would help both kids, clear their heads, give their parents some respite. As long as I don't have to feed them, Oshin had told their parents. Of course you have to feed them, their parents said. Eventually, they agreed that Oshin would buy them food, but would not cook. He didn't even cook for himself, subsisted on sandwiches and did not eat out. He loathed the concept of restaurants, serving, ordering, all the groveling and tipping and complaining. His approach was to get food, eat food, eliminating all the attendant ceremony and supplication. This was the kind of thing the extended family expected of him, eccentricities of an old man who lived in a woodland hermit. They won't have phones, Kala's mother said, and Oshin couldn't decide if that was a good thing or not. He didn't want to plan a month of activities for two L.A. teenagers. Had they ever seen a tree? A river unbound by concrete? He sat at the baggage claim, nursing a dull dread. These two could be awful. They could be terrible individually and far worse together. What if they fought with each other? He hadn't heard a raised voice in years. If they quarreled, 
he'd send them away and burn the cabin down. Evie had mailed him photos of Calla and Torrin, and he brought the photos with him like a hitman. Each plane landing at the Haley Airport only had 20 or so people on it, so he didn't think he'd have difficulty sorting the two of them out. While he waited, he flipped through a free magazine, a guide to the Wood River Valley region, and stopped at an article about the local theater group. My God, he thought, that's her. Fay away Yount. He'd seen her in As You Like It a few years ago, the only play he'd been to since college. She was magnetic, wry, lithe, with a mane of rich auburn hair. And the name, Fayaway. He assumed it was a stage name. Only twice had he fallen in love from afar, and each time he coveted the feeling, telling no one, forgetting nothing. The first time was with a woman crossing the street in Hartford, Connecticut in 1989. She was in some kind of security guard uniform and was carrying a white umbrella in the sun. Oshin had never married, had never been a romancer, and did not romance women now. He was 72, and Fayaway Yount couldn't be more than 50. Even the thought of it was pitiable, distasteful. His sagging, pasty flesh next to her taut olive skin. Look at that face. In the magazine, she was posing behind a rough-hewn fence, her arms resting on it in an effort to look at ease. She was wearing a kind of cowgirl outfit, brand new, totally unconvincing, and no doubt the photographer's idea. And yet her eyes bore into the viewer. I have swallowed worlds, they said. That's really my given name, she said in the article. They assume, because I'm an actor, that it's a play on Faye Dunaway, but really, my parents got it from Melville. There was a young woman in the Marquesas named Fayaway, a beautiful girl who captured his heart. My parents fell in love with the name after Melville fell in love with her. The article said Fayaway, the Idaho Fayaway, was single. Oshin? He startled uh, and looked up. <clears throat> it was them. Calla was in overalls, cloth bracelets up and down her arms. Torin wore a black hoodie and long black shorts. Headphones dangled from their ears. Good magazine? Calla asked. Who's the lady? Oshin put the magazine back in the rack, though immediately wished that he hadn't. He wanted to finish the article at home, to reread it, to have that photo of Fayaway Yount, her eyes boring into him. He grabbed the magazine, rolled it up, and put it under his arm. How's the flight? he asked. It was a triumph, Calla said. And now I'm in Idaho. Torin giggled in a falsetto. Thus far, they were insufferable. <laughs> With divine clarity, Oshin knew the best thing for all involved would be for the two of them to take the next plane home. These yours, he asked, reaching for the two roller bags next to Calla. We'll get them, Calla said. You carry your magazine. Oshin eyed his van in the distance. He pictured driving away in it, alone. Who would fault him? Thank you for picking us up, Torrance said. Ah, Oshin thought. He's the polite one. His mom told him to always thank people at the start, like when you get in the car, Calla said. That way you don't forget. He told me that on the plane. Oshin saw that Torin was horrified, as if suddenly realizing that nothing he would ever tell Calla would remain private. And then Oshin remembered something Torin's father had said. It was Calla who needed the quiet month in Idaho. Torin, a shy kid, was there as a kind of buffer. She's a strong dose, he'd said. If Torin comes, they can entertain each other so you don't have to. This is it, Oshin said when they arrived at his van. It had once belonged to an electrician friend of his. 
It was long and cavernous. Shotgun, Calla said, and took the front seat. She rolled down her window and spoke to Oshin with her elbow on the window frame. I don't drive, she said, and looked into the largely empty hull of the van. But if I did, I would never drive something like this. Torin had never been anywhere and had never seen anything. This was the longest trip he'd ever taken, and it was only two hours by plane. He'd met Oshin twice at family reunions and had only cursory conversations with him. He did not know or like old people and did not look forward to spending time with this one. He was in Idaho for Kala. This can't be it, she said. They were standing in front of Oshin's cabin. It'll be tight, Oshin said. He made a barely audible hmm sound as if just now realizing he would be sharing it with two full-sized people. Torrin had no reaction at all. It didn't look possible that anyone lived there, let alone that the three of them would cohabitate for the month. It was not quite a cabin. Set below a steep mountain dense with pines, it looked like the decaying dwelling of an ancient wizard. There was something about the pitched roof crooked and covered in moss that hinted at fading magic. A ladder leaned against its side, further confusing the geometry. Do you have tents? Kala asked. I'd almost rather stay in a tent. What about you? She turned to Torin, who thought the idea of sharing a tent with Kala wildly intoxicating. I actually think you'll like it inside, Oshin said, and walked across the gravel to the clearing around the cabin. Torrin followed Kala in, and the smell hit him first. Pine and lacquer, and the airless scent of all-day sun on old wood. The whole of the cabin was one room, about the size of a standard bedroom with a tiny kitchen in the back, facing the river. The walls were cluttered with random things, old snowshoes, a photo of Roberto Clemente, and what looked like a conquistador sword. Can I ask why you live out here? Cal asked. Torrin almost laughed, because Cal's form of humor had everything to do with saying the wrong thing and suddenly. But this time he resisted. He had no living grandparents and had been brought up to treat the elderly with a deference approaching condescension. Remember what T.E. Lawrence said about the desert? Oshin asked. He liked it because it was clean. But... Your place isn't clean, Kala said. I said, Idaho was clean, Oshin said. Not my place. And my place is not unclean. You think it's unclean? I spent all yesterday fixing it up. It looks good, Torin said, and watched as Kala made a more thorough assessment. She drew her finger across the mantle, surprised to find it free of dust. I guess it's just cluttered. It reminds me of a guitar... It's like living inside a guitar. She turned to Torin. Isn't it like living inside of a guitar? Torin thought this was harmless enough. Sort of, he said. And there's no bathroom, Kala said. They knew there was no bathroom. This had been emphasized during every mention of the summer plan. Oshin had no indoor plumbing at all but she seemed to be stating this most unconscionable fact in the hope that it wasn't true. Follow me, Oshin said, and he led them across the gravel drive to the outhouse, a moon and a trio of stars cut into its higher regions. Torn expected the odor to be overwhelming, but when he opened the plywood door, it just smelled like more wood. There was a toilet seat embedded into a wooden shelf, and next to the seat there was a tube of hand sanitizer and a tall tower of toilet paper rolls. Got those when the bus station in Haley ordered too many, Oshin said. Score, Kala said. <laughs> and look, she pointed to a small plaque commemorating the fact that it had been built in 1941. Torin, you get to shit in a historical landmark. With sudden clarity, Torin realized that Kala wasn't planning to stay. 
She would call home, make up an excuse, or flat out escape. Oshin let the door close with a smack. Let's go to the lake, he said. Kala. Kala did plan to escape. Oshin was far older than she remembered and far stranger, and his cabin was not habitable. She would feel bad for Torin, would feel momentarily guilty about leaving him to the old wizard, but she couldn't take him with her. That would be kidnapping and statutory something, and beyond that, her parents and Torin's would murder her if she made him any kind of accomplice. This is the most beautiful alpine lake you'll ever see, Oshin said. They were rumbling down the two-lane road in his rickety, ugly-ass van, and cars were periodically passing them as if they were standing still. The speed limit was 65, but the van didn't seem capable of breaking 50. Kala had no interest in this lake. Lakes were for people who didn't live near the ocean, and alpine lakes were just lakes too cold to swim in. She had no interest in the bald black hills Oshin kept pointing to, the sight of this or that forest fire. Burn, Idaho, burn, she thought, and wished she had someone near who would appreciate her joke. Torin was too innocent, too good. She'd seen his horrified face when she'd hazed Oshin about his filthy home. I rented a boat, Oshin said as they pulled into the parking lot. All around were corny log cabins and fat families waddling around carrying paddle boards and rafts. Wow, Kala said. This is the most beautiful alpine lake I've ever seen. Torin laughed. They hadn't seen the lake yet. Oshin looked at her in a way she took to mean disappointment. He was actually an interesting old guy, she thought. Not scolding, not grumpy. There was something in his eyes, in fact, that implied he understood her sarcasm but found it unfunny. They made their way past the main lodge, and then the vista opened up. The lake was a bright blue mirror with jagged white mountain range at the end. It looked like a screensaver. There was a wide lawn, then a small beach bright with umbrellas and rafts, then the tiny waves of the lake rushing to the shore like mad, happy mops. A musical trio was playing something folky on the lawn, a few dozen older fans watching from folding chairs. Kala had never been to Switzerland, but her idea of Switzerland was this. Everything clean and orderly and full of families and bright clothing acting appropriately and not too loud. I'll go deal with the boat, Oshin said and made his way toward the docks. Kala got her first clear look at him. He walked purposefully, not at all frail, wearing long faded blue shorts and canvas sneakers. From a distance he could have been 40, 50, the father of one of her friends. Oshin stopped at the rental desk, around which there were a handful of pedal boards and kayaks and motorboats for rent bobbing in the clear water. Kala thought it would be kind of fun to see what it was like out on the lake. She hadn't been on a boat in years. <laughs> but then again, if she said she'd get seasick and that she'd stay on the beach while Oshin and Torin took the boat out, it would give her time to disappear. She could hitch call a taxi, run through the woods, anything. She'd have hours before they knew. When Oshin was out of earshot, Kala turned to Torin. I'm leaving, she said. I hope you understand. Obviously, I can't take you with me. Leaving for where, he said. Back home, probably. I don't know. I have an aunt in Minneapolis. Maybe I'll go that direction. Torin's big eyes were wet. I'll go with you, he said. You're 15, she said. It would be like kidnapping. I'd go to jail. He seemed on the verge of tears. I'll, I'll explain it to anyone, he said in a desperate rush, that it was my choice. I, I can be useful. You're much safer if you're not alone. <sighs> this kid, Kala thought. He loved her. That much was obvious. You're cute, but no, she said. I'd get arrested. I'm 19, so... You can't drive, he said. I know how. How will, you get a, any, a, get, how will you get anywhere when you can't drive? Good point, she thought. 
I'll hitch, she said. My mom used to. She did it all over the country, all over fucking Greece. Apparently she was allowed to do shit like that, and I'm not. Now O'Sheen was walking back from the dock. He looked far older from the front, his face carved from the bark of a gnarled tree. He waved to them, a pair of keys in his hand. Torin. No one knew Torin was Machiavellian and he preferred it that way. He was both a good kid and also knew he was a good kid and knew how to bring about events in his favor. He didn't want Kala to leave him alone with this strange old man and he had no idea how to prevent her from leaving. For now, though, he only had to postpone her escape. He had to get her on the boat. Oshin was drawing near. I totally get it, he whispered to Kala. You can't do it now. There's nothing here. No buses, trains, taxis. There's damn sure no Ubers at Redfish Lake. Already he saw her face softening into recognition. She seemed impressed, too, by his use of damn sure. He'd never sworn in her presence before. <laughs> Wait until we go into town, he said. We have to, probably later today for groceries. That'll be the place. Go there, get on a truck, or catch a bus out of town. Do it there. You'll have options. She smiled. He had her. Oshin. It was uncanny. What was she doing here? Oshin had made his way back from the dock, and when he crossed the green lawn to get the kids, he'd seen her. Feiwei Yount. She was singing in a trio on the lawn. He didn't know she sang, but, of course, all actresses sing, and, of course, she would be singing in a trio in a place like this. Everyone around here had four jobs. She was probably a pharmacist, too. <laughs> he moved closer to the small stage, and as he did, he tuned out the squeals of children on the beach and the yaps of dogs in the shallow water. It was her. She was wearing a red linen button-down over a long cotton skirt, and she stood barefoot on the grass singing with her eyes closed. Somehow she was more winsome this way in the daylight, her hair pulled back, her toes in the grass. And then her eyes opened and fell on Oshin, briefly but unmistakably before she looked up to the sky where the corpulent clouds pulsed with kept sun. It's her, isn't it? Kala was right behind him. I recognize her from the magazine. Jesus, Oshin, you're in love. <laughs> Oshin was growing less fond of this Kala by the minute. <laughs> Torin was straightforward and shy, two admirable traits in a teenager, while this older one was acidic, maybe even cruel. We should get going, Oshin said. We only have the boat for two hours. But he badly wanted to stay. One more song, Kala said, lowering her voice, trying to contain her glee. Seriously, I didn't mean to be annoying. If you like her, you know, music, then we should stay. She was trying to suppress a grin. We're going, Oshin said. Kala and Torin followed him up the do narrow dock into the boat he'd rented. He glanced one more time toward Feiwei. He actually didn't care that Kala knew his feelings. And what were his feelings? His feelings were that he found Feiwe very beautiful, and she sang with a gorgeous low mezzo-soprano like the rush of a shallow river, but he had no intentions beyond listening to her. He loved beauty, needed to always be near beauty, and when an unusual beauty was near, he found himself gripped, immobilized. It had always been this way, but he'd never needed to possess this beauty. Nearness was always enough. Kala. She was giddy. She'd correctly diagnosed the crush of a 72-year-old man on a 50-year-old woman. Yes! It was adorable. And now she wondered if she really could leave when such delicious work was to be done here, and she the only one to do it. She followed Oshin to the small motorboat at the end of the dock. Silver indented, it looked like army surplus. 
Two teenaged boys, a year or two younger than Kala, showed them the mechanical features of the boat, handed them their vests, and then stood on the dock, inspecting Kala from behind, their wraparound sunglasses giving them cover. Oshin dropped their bag onto the boat with a dull thump and started the engine. Torin sat dutifully by his side, and Kala took the bow. They puttered through the no-wake zone, passing candy-colored kayaks and paddle boards. And when they passed the last buoy, Oshin put the base of his hand to the throttle. The bow lifted. They gained speed and unzipped the lake lengthwise. They sped toward the sawtooth mountains, which rose from the glassy surface of the lake like gray men in white shawls. When they arrived at the lake's far end, they were alone. No vessels or people in sight. Oshin cut the engine and turned to them. So, which one of you had the pills? He asked. Me, Kala said. I had some friends over. They found a prescription bottle in the garbage that had three pills still in it. You know, Dilladad. Dilladad, Oshin corrected. Okay, Dilladad, she said. That just started things. They found more pills upstairs. I helped, actually. Kala did not expect him to be scandalized. She'd heard stories about Oshin. He'd been a hippie, and a soldier, and a hermit. He worked as a welder, a long-haul trucker, a river guide. She was unsure what would shock him. For the time being, he simply stared at the mountains as she spoke. I'd stashed a few bottles of champagne from Christmas, she said. So we had a party and everyone got sick and one girl got scared and called her mom and she ended up getting her stomach pumped even though she'd taken less than anyone else. The rest of us, someone should have died. Could have died, Oshin said. Could have died, Kala repeated. Not should have died, he said, turning back to her. Don't say should have, okay? Okay, Kala said. She didn't know what to do with his attention focused on her like this. She found it disorienting, annoying, thrilling. They hadn't dropped an anchor, so the gentle current was pushing them toward the shore, where a tangle of downed pines were wedged between a trio of people-high boulders. The wind picked up. And Torin, I'm sorry to hear about your mom, Oshin said coming from anyone else pivoting so quickly from one personal shit show to the next, it would have sounded false and perfunctory. I know she'll get better. Thanks, Torin said. When she was a girl, she went up Mount Lassen with me and Patrick. She must have been ten <laughs> in sandals. And she never complained. Did she ever tell you that? Torin. I think so, Torin said though he had no recollection of a story like that. His mother was what to Oshin, a niece? Something about the story unsettled him. Was it the kind of thing you said about someone dead or dying? Every day since her stroke, Torin flung himself between defending her and being disgusted by her. Half her face fallen, numb, her constant drooling, the thick-tongued way she spoke now. He was avoiding Oshin's eyes, looking into the lake when he saw it. A diaper floating on the surface. Look, he said, relieved to change the subject. Huh, Oshin said. You never see garbage on this lake. See if you can grab it. Torin reached down to get it. The diaper was heavy with lake water. He dropped it onto the boat floor with a wet slap. Whole bunch of other stuff over here, Kala said. She was looking over the other side of the boat. A sandal, a bag of chips. Oh shit, a life preserver. There was a dark, snaking object that Torin took to be a shirt. A styrofoam cooler open with an apple core inside. A plastic water bottle half full. It was as if someone had dumped the contents of a beach bag. Grab as much as you can, Oshin said. What do you think happened? Kala asked. Looks like it fell off a boat, Oshin said, his voice wavering. Maybe they were going fast and didn't realize they'd lost this stuff. Torn leaned down, pulling from the lake a dark sweater wound around a life vest. 
He dropped it on the boat's deck. Over here, Kala said, and grabbed a plastic carton of baby wipes. Shit. Why is there a diaper and wet wipes? I'm freaking out now. Torn's heart hammered. He scanned the water, expecting to see a baby. Look, Callie yelled. Bonnet! Baby bonnet! She held it up, horrified, flinging it back into the water. What the fuck is all this? Calm down, Oshin said. Torn was still leaning over the edge, reaching for a pair of goggles when he saw, a few feet under the surface, the ghostly white triangle of the bow of a boat. Oshin. Oshin rushed to Torrin's side. The bow was sticking straight up, not three feet from the surface. To be positioned that way, and with all their possessions still close, the sinking must have been recent. Look for people, he said evenly. People? Where? Kala said. Oshin searched the shoreline, hoping to find a family shivering there. He could see one of the small campsite beaches, not more than 200 yards away. There were a few families lounging in the shallows, oblivious. Whoever had been in this boat was not on shore, which meant they were still inside the boat. But none of this made sense. A single boat sunk in 20 feet of water and no one else near? Oshin was staring down, furious at himself that he hadn't already jumped in when he heard a splash. He turned to see Kala's ankles disappear. Kala. It felt like crashing through plate glass. The water was hard, cold, clear, and she touched the boat immediately. It was so close she'd struck it at nearly full force. She felt its smooth white bow and took the railing and pulled herself down the side, hand over hand. She saw no people, no sign of people. The, the boat was the same kind Oshin had rented. It, it had no cabin. She wanted no cabin. A cabin could mean there were people trapped inside. A baby, even. A hand gripped her calf. She screamed underwater. Bubbles exploded from her mouth. A second hand appeared in front of her, and she screamed again. Finally, she saw a face. It was Oshin. Oshin. He jumped in after her and, and thought he should let her know he was there, too, so she wouldn't be startled if she saw him. But his plan had produced the opposite effect. He saw her point herself toward the surface and kick her way up to the light. Oshin's lungs were on fire. He had about 30 seconds of air left, so he grabbed the windshield of the boat and used it to pull himself downward. It was the same boat they'd rented, no cabin. There was nothing visible, nothing but a towel that had been tied to the stern. He pulled himself farther down, determined to reach the outboard, thinking there was a chance that someone was stuck underneath. The boat could have hit chop, gone airborne, flipped, sunk. He pulled himself down, hand over hand on the side rail until he was at the bottom. The water was thick with sand and muck, but he saw nothing near the motor. Whatever happened to the people on this boat, they were no longer here. Just as he was ready to return to the surface, he heard a dull crash above and looked up to see Torin's body, like an arrow, shooting downward. Torin. Oshin had been under too long. Kala had flung herself up from the lake and was gasping, holding on to the back ladder. Go check on him, she'd said, and Torin had thrown off his shirt, shaping himself into a dagger and dove, finding himself instantly at the bottom of the lake. Oshin was struggling under the boat. It looked like a tug of war with Oshin violently pulling away from the outboard. Torin swam closer and waved to Oshin. Oshin pointed to his shorts, which were tangled in the motor's corkscrew. Torin tried to unweave the fabric, but it was no use. Oshin's struggling had drawn it too taut. Torin began to, uh, instead to pull down on the shorts with an aim to take them off completely. Oshin understood. He fumbled at the drawstring, but it wouldn't give. Torn needed scissors or a blade. Oshin couldn't die this way, Torn thought. This old man could die while trying to untie his shorts. But then he did it. Oshin loosened the knot. Torn pulled down, the shorts went slack, and Oshin went free and upward, and Torn followed. Kala. They dragged Oshin into the boat, his naked body bony and blue, and now the sky was a low iron ceiling. The sun was gone, the wind was slashing. They raced across the lake into the docks. 
close to shore while Torin steered. Calla waved her arms wildly. She wanted people to worry, to panic, to scream. She got the attention of the two boys working at the dock. They ran to the slip closest and began guiding Torin in. Cut the engine! Cut the engine! They yelled. Torin didn't know what they meant. Turn the keys in the ignition, O'Sheen said. Left. He lay in the back of the boat, Torin's t-shirt draped over his midsection. Kala was startled to hear him speak. She'd assumed he was dying or dead. Torin turned the keys left, the engine died. They drifted into the dock. One of the dock boys jumped into their boat and steered it into a slip. Is he dead, he asked, staring at O'Sheen's blue face. Just cold, O'Sheen said. Kala jumped from the boat. A young couple was getting out of another rental and she pulled their towels from their shoulders. Need these? she said, and ran back to O'Sheen. She put one towel under his head and the other over his waist. Can you sit up, she asked. In a minute, he said. Tell them about the capsized boat. We saw a boat, Torin said, sunk on the other end of the lake by the mountains. You know anything about it? It's fine, one of the boys said. It sunk yesterday. Everyone's fine. What about the baby, O'Sheen asked. The baby wasn't on the boat, the boy said. It was my aunt who rented the boat. The baby wasn't there. They left the baby on shore. O'Sheen laughed. They left the baby on shore, he said, and passed out. O'Sheen. He couldn't get warm. He'd been brought into the lodge and installed in a giant leather chair by the fire, but he couldn't get warm. The lodge's staff huddled around him, laid blankets upon blankets upon him. Kala wanted to call the paramedics, but he refused. He begged Kala and Torin and the lodge manager, Helen, not to call anyone. He'd walked himself off the boat, he noted, off the dock, across the beach, and into the lodge, talking all the while. He did not need a hospital, he said. He needed to catch his breath, stare at the fire, get warm. Soon the staff floated away, watching him from across the amber-colored room, leading him to Kala and Torin. They were sitting on the fireplace hearth, their backs to the fire, talking to O'Sheen, watching him warily. Don't worry, he told them. O'Sheen was worried. Not worried. Concerned. Concerned because he couldn't get warm. He'd been inside the lodge for 30 minutes and was still shivering uncontrollably. The lake had been cold, but it was the naked ride back that had done it. The wind had cut through him, made him feel feather light and porous. If not for that ride back with that icy wind, he would have been fine. Now he was fighting violent chills. Just when he muffled one, another came on. He looked at the clock, 4.30. If he wasn't better by five, he'd let the kids call a doctor. But uh, a doctor meant an ambulance and a hospital and a gown and a building full of infections. And everyone he knew, everyone his age who'd gone in, had never come out. Torin. Torin drove them home. At six, just as the dinner rush began to crowd the lodge, O'Sheen's chills subsided and he said he wanted to go home. They had to sneak out of the lodge, really, for otherwise there would have been questions. Aren't you too young to drive? Where are you all going? Are you sure he's okay? What's your address, your phone number, so we can check up on him? O'Sheen was in the front seat, leaning against the window, wearing sweatpants and wool socks and a knit cap and a hoodie, all donated by the Redfish Lake gift shop. There were no turns on the road from the lake to O'Sheen's cabin, so Torin kept his hands at ten and two, feeling godlike, urgent, Kala's bare thigh against his. Kala. In the morning, Kala felt sure that O'Sheen might die. She and Torin were outside the cabin debating next steps. They'd been up all night taking turns watching him, feeling his forehead, covering him with every blanket and sheet in the cabin. They'd wrapped his feet in needlepoint pillowcases. He's like 80, she said. At that age, anything goes. They get a cold, and then they're dead. (laughs) He's still clammy and feverish. Then let's call the hospital, Torin said. No hospital, she said. But we can find a doctor. 
Oshin. He lay inside on his bed, hearing their muffled conversation, very much amused. He was not close to death and had told them this all through the night whenever they checked on him. He was sure they had not slept all night. Each time he woke up, one of them was at his side, sitting on the hard Quaker chair he used to stack kindling. It was not made for long sits. One time he woke to find Kala holding his hand, the bones in her knuckles so smooth and so cold, like river stones. Another time he found Torin standing on the other side of the room, hands behind his back, looking out the window like a general before battle. All along, the room had been illuminated by candles. How had they found the candles? Even he didn't know where the candles were kept. <laughs> and now it was morning, and Oshin felt much better, was hungry, in fact. And these two were outside, considering his imminent death. Torin. It was Torin's idea to return to the lake. By mid-morning, Oshin seemed much better. His face had gone from gray to pink, and his temperatures seemed close to normal, but it would not hurt to bring a doctor back to the cabin. Kala had convinced Torin a hospital, if against Oshin's wishes, was out of the question. But simply going to the lake and bringing a doctor back, they agreed, would not violate any pact. The lake was close enough and full of people, and surely one of them was a doctor or a nurse, and it was the only place they knew how to get to. Torin drove with arms stiff, breathing tensely through his nose, occasionally glancing at the sky, the mountains, the half-burned forests all around them. You're doing good, Kala said, and Torin felt triumphant. Kala, when they arrived at the lake, immediately she felt silly. How would they find a doctor? They couldn't go to Helen, the lodge manager, and ask who among their guests was a doctor. Helen would know what was up and would call an ambulance. Walking the beach asking for a doctor would have the same, would have the same effect. There would be inquiries and fuss. This, Kala told Torin, was not a good idea. But then she saw the actress. <laughs> Torin. He did not think they should talk to the actress. She was singing in her band again on the wide lawn with the dragon mountains behind her. Let's ask her to come back with us, Kala said, and let loose a mad soliloquy about death and desire. Oh, she might die, she said, might die that day, and that if they could not get a doctor for him, they might give him purpose by arranging a visit from this woman. Torn was aghast. Kala had lost her mind. They came to get a doctor, but were bringing home a singer? <laughs> let's ask at le let's at least ask her, Kala said. I won't do it, Torrin said. I will, Kala said. Kala. She waited till the end of the band set, which might have been cut short because she was lingering in front, staring at Faye away with unsettling intensity. We need a favor, said Kala. It was not a bother for Feyway. Unusual, yes, but not so unusual for this region. She'd been in this part of Idaho on and off for 30 years, and she'd met more than a few off-the-grid oddballs. One noted hermit, Salmon River Sal, had come to a production of three days of rain on three consecutive nights. He had introduced himself politely afterward, and she'd never heard from him again. Some years later, she read that he died in his lair. Among his few belongings was a program from that play. So this did not seem so different. The two kids acting as intermediary was a new one, but otherwise she was accustomed to the attention of older men, gentlemanly men, who rarely wanted anything more than a moment's proximity. She was surprised when the younger, smaller one got into the driver's seat of the long white van. The girl was taller, seemed older, and more capable. But Feyway got in her truck and followed them the 20 miles to the old man's cabin. It was this kind of thing that had brought her and kept her in these small towns, these jumbled Idaho towns that had, it seemed, rolled down the mountains to settle like stones on the valley floor. 
Through the van's rear windows, she watched the two kids, the backs of their heads, as they looked steadily at the winding road ahead. Such purpose. Back at the lodge, she had taken them to be the same kind of listless, scowling kids that her friends had produced. But then they laid out their request and had provided a short biography of their uncle, or great uncle, and their vision seized her. This kind of thing never happened in the suburbs of Atlanta when she was raised, was being raised. Only in the emptiness of Idaho could you see people one by one and breathe a bit and ask a favor like this. She felt at home in their dream. Oshin. He was home and awake and feeling fine. Earlier, he'd gotten up, fixed himself a bowl of mush, and changed into his own clothes. That operation had tuckered him out, though, so when he heard the van come in, spitting gravel and stopping in a rush of white dust, he was reclining again, covered in a light wool blanket. There was no window that faced the driveway, so he couldn't see them coming in. But he heard a solicitousness in the voices of the kids that was new. Then he heard a third voice, flute-like, almost familiar. The door opened and Torin's face appeared, his brow furrowed, apologetic. Kala followed, chin up, grinning, eyes alight. You look good, she said. She seemed surprised. You do. Torrance said, and you changed clothes. I am good, Oshin said, and I did change. We brought a guest, Kala said, just to cheer you up. It's not a priest. <laughs> Oshin laughed. Kala gestured to the open door, and Feiwei Yount entered his cabin. Feiwei Yount was in his cabin, and immediately he saw it through her eyes. He was an animal living in a cave, a burrow. He was not fully human. He watched as she looked around briefly, her eyes adjusting to the darkness and the clutter, and then she found him, the old man in the corner. She smiled and came to him. How are you? she asked, sitting in the hard Quaker chair. She was Gorgeous up close. Far more radiant than on stage or in any photo. Everything about her, even the whites of her eyes, was polished bright. She stayed for ten minutes or so, looking at Oshin like a nurse, as if she were playing a nurse. A nurse who knew just the effect she had on the blubbering men in her care. There was nothing in her demeanor that said she would ever consider... Oshin, a man for her to kiss and love. But still, he adored her for coming all this way, for following these two kids to him. Oshin looked over her shoulder and found them, Kala and Torin. They had become a kind of parental couple, leaning into each other as they watched, biting their nails, hoping they'd done something right. There is still courage among us, Oshin thought. It only has to be urged forth. From the depths of our selfish selves, it has to be called upon. These two, who had seemed to him so flimsy yesterday, turned out to be monumental. They had gorgeous butterfly hearts, beating hard within ribs of gold. And they could be trusted with the world. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's James, James Norton, Kennedy Kawakawa, and Emily Stegg. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. That is a story called Where the Candles Are Kept uh, by Dave Eggers. We are finished with this section.